Tonight, after being slammed for its slow start, Ontario is accelerating its vaccine rollout. Once we get the machine going in Ontario, we kick butt. The Ford government now setting a deadline for vaccinating all long-term care residents in the province's hotspots as outbreaks remain at an all-time high. Plus... This certainly just seems to be a knee-jerk reaction when they've had so much time. Travelers boarding a flight to Canada will soon have to provide a negative COVID test. We speak with a man who traveled abroad before the new rules were announced and is now struggling to come back. And re-envisioning Ontario Place. Will the new year bring new possibilities for the landmark? We speak with the daughter of the original architect about what she'd like to see. Good evening, I'm Kelda Yoon. A member of Ontario's COVID-19 science advisory table has resigned tonight amid news that he vacationed in the Dominican Republic over the holidays. This says politicians in this province and across the country have faced backlash over their decisions to travel abroad during a pandemic. Now, Dr. Tom Stewart is listed as being a member of the command table. He is also the CEO of St. Joseph's Health System and Niagara Health System. In an email to CBC News, a spokesperson for St. Joe's confirms Dr. Stewart was on approved vacation from December 18th until today. Now, a quote attributed to Stewart states, I regret this non-essential travel and I'm sorry. Everyone should be avoiding non-essential travel now, including me. And a spokesperson for the Ministry of Health confirming late tonight that Stewart has resigned from the COVID-19 science advisory table. The statement continues, the people of Ontario have made countless sacrifices during the pandemic and it remains critically important that everyone continues to follow public health advice. And Ontario is vowing to pick up the pace of COVID-19 vaccinations starting in long-term care homes. The Ford government has set January 21st as the date it will complete vaccinations for all long-term care residents in the worst hit parts of the province. But as our Queen's Park reporter Mike Crawley reports, some are still saying that's not fast enough. A team from Michael Guerin Hospital arrives at the True Davidson Home for the Aged, armed with vaccines against COVID-19. Are you ready? <laughs> Mobile teams from the hospital have already vaccinated some 2,200 residents and staff at long-term care homes in Toronto's East End. It's part of the push to vaccinate at all long-term care homes in the places worst hit by COVID. That's Toronto. Peel, York, and Windsor Essex. The government's target for achieving that goal, January 21st. Throughout this pandemic, it might take us a week, maybe a couple weeks to ramp up, but once we get the machine going in Ontario, we kick butt. We want to ensure that those vulnerable people, that is our first priority, are going to be protected as soon as we possibly can. But is it soon enough? That deadline sets a pace of vaccinating barely 3,000 people per day. It's slow, and again, those delays are going to cost lives. The province is not giving a timeline for when it will vaccinate long-term care residents and health workers in the rest of the province. The fact that we're struggling with distribution right now at a point in the epidemic where this really, really could make a difference it's frustrating. Ontario is expecting to receive another 80,000 doses of the Pfizer-BioNTech vaccine each week in January. Another 50,000 doses of the Moderna vaccine are due next Monday. It's more easily deployed to long-term care homes because it doesn't require ultra-low temperature storage. Yes, thank you, and we'll come back in 28 days. Amid all the questions about the pace of the vaccine rollout, Premier Doug Ford has not held a news conference for two weeks. In that time frame, the number of COVID patients in hospitals has risen by 34%. Another 37,000 people have contracted the virus and more than 540 people have died. Mike Crawley, CBC News, Toronto. CBC Toronto is also learning of another issue with the vaccine rollout. At seniors' buildings that contain both long-term care homes and retirement living apartments, not every resident will be able to get the vaccine right away. Chris Glover has more on who will be prioritized and why some have concerns with the plan. 
The walls at Copernicus Lodge in Roncesville divide more than just rooms. Where you live in this senior's building is set to determine whether you're eligible for a COVID vaccine now or not. So we know that those residents are sitting ducks. Dr. Samir Sinha, the director of geriatrics with Mount Sinai Health, says it is unacceptable that the long-term care residents within the building are currently being signed up to get vaccinated, but the seniors living in the facility's apartments have to wait. We have enough vaccine to get all these people done. Why we're actually picking and choosing and putting people at risk doesn't make any sense to me. 101-year-old Tony Morofsky and his 92-year-old wife Jean live in the apartment side of Copernicus. Their family is desperate to get them vaccinated. And Dr. Sinha says they're at elevated risk of catching and dying from COVID. Because of their age, plus the nursing home side of Copernicus is in outbreak. 47 LTC residents have COVID. But retirement homes that are specifically actually co-located with long-term care homes that often share staff, you know, are higher risk environments. And our hope is that we'll be able to start this week. Dr. Jenny Clement is a family physician at Copernicus. She says no residents have been vaccinated yet. They're still getting necessary permissions since many have dementia. She says the ministry instructed them to start with the LTC residents only. One of the things that's challenging about this is that we have to have a stepwise process. Right. And so there there really isn't uh, I, I certainly feel for the families that want their loved ones vaccinated. Unity Health overseeing their vaccine program said in a statement to CBC Toronto, the apartments as yet do not fall into the criteria that has presently been identified by the Ministry of Health and Toronto Public Health. As if to demonstrate how vulnerable he is, today Morofsky was rushed to hospital for a different health concern, not suspected of having COVID. And so when we actually have vaccines that are literally sitting in freezers, my view is if there's any older person in a congregate setting, get them vaccinated ASAP. Another big issue at this home is that long-term care staff members here have been offered the Pfizer vaccine, but Dr. Jenny Clement says that a very minor fraction of those health care workers have have actually agreed to take the vaccine and she says that that is very scary and very frustrating especially frustrating when you consider the fact that some families are desperate to get the vaccine for their loved ones chris glover cbc news toronto and taking a look at the daily numbers, new infections continue to hover above 3,000. But the big concern today is the number of people hospitalized. The province is reporting over 3,100 new cases of COVID-19 today with 51 more deaths. There are now over 1,300 people with COVID-19 in hospital. That's a new high. Of those, 352 are being treated in intensive care and 245 are on ventilators. Those are also record high numbers. Just over 35,000 tests were processed for the virus. The test positivity rate stands at 9.4%. Meanwhile, the province's first field hospital built during the pandemic is now accepting patients in hopes of taking some of the strain off the health care system. The field hospital was built on the grounds of Joseph Brandt Hospital in Burlington. It can treat patients with COVID-19 whose condition has stabilized but still requires support they can't receive at home, such as oxygen therapy. The hospital cost about $2 million to build. It can accommodate 93 patients. And there are concerns tonight over new pandemic rules for travelers set to kick in Thursday. Now, last week, the federal government announced air travelers aged five or older will be required to show a negative COVID test result before flying to Canada. But the airline industry says the rules are still unclear and confusion over them may leave some Canadians stranded abroad. Angelina King spoke with a man in Jamaica who was trying to make his way home. <laughs> Mark Josephs didn't let the pandemic and travel restrictions get in the way of a happy reunion with his grandsons after a year apart. He and his wife traveled from the GTA to Jamaica on December 27th to meet family from the U.S. Being of Jamaican background, I chose to come to Jamaica because they have been extremely strict in their guidelines for travel. 
Three days into their visit, he learned he'd need a negative COVID-19 test to fly home, which means he needs to get tested tomorrow. But there are no appointments available. Plus, the rules for tourists don't allow him to leave the area and make the hour-long journey to the nearest site. It's really not about me. It's just the overall situation that it puts travelers in and um, and also the strain that it puts on country's resources. The airline has emailed Joseph saying he can't board the flight without a negative test, which Transport Canada reiterated today. But last week, the minister said if travellers can prove they couldn't get a test, they can still fly home, but would need to quarantine in a federally regulated facility. We are a little bit more than 24 hours from, from the start of the program. We do not have the final regulations. The National Airlines Council of Canada says the confusion could have been avoided. Had the government consulted with industry and implemented the rules much earlier, which it had pushed Ottawa to do. The government is scrambling to get its homework done, which means by definition, we are going to be scrambling uh, for implementation and passengers are going to be scrambling. In a statement, Transport Canada said in part, details of the draft requirements have been shared with industry and Transport Canada will provide further guidance for air operators. Joseph says he understands he may not get sympathy since he chose to travel during the pandemic. He's on board with the government's new rules. He's just frustrated with how it's being rolled out. This certainly just seems to be a knee-jerk reaction when they've had so much time. The Airlines Council and a group of major Canadian airlines, including WestJet and Air Canada, are now calling on the federal government to delay implementing the rules until January 18th. Angelina King, CBC News, Toronto. The Special Investigations Unit is probing a police-involved shooting in Niagara-on-the-Lake after a man died this afternoon. At around 1.30 p.m., Niagara Regional Police Service were called to Lundy's Lane and Corwin Avenue following a report of a suspected impaired driver. Now, an hour later, the vehicle was located in the area of Line 3 and the Niagara River Parkway. There was an interaction with a man and he was subsequently shot by police. The man was transported to hospital with life-threatening injuries where he was pronounced dead. A number of roads are still closed in the area for the police investigation. And a security guard is suffering from serious injuries after a stabbing this afternoon. It happened near York and Wellington around 3.30 this afternoon. Police say the suspect fled on foot and was last seen heading west on Wellington. The security guard has been transported to hospital. Police are asking any witnesses to come forward. And a truck driver is in hospital with critical injuries after an unusual and catastrophic crash early this morning. The collision took place on the eastbound 401 near the Allen Road exit at around 1.20 a.m. Police say a transport truck was stopped on the right shoulder of the express lanes when another tractor trailer approached it from behind. The approaching truck then struck a barrier, causing the front end of the cab to slam into an abutment of an overhead bridge. The driver of that truck was trapped in the cab for more than an hour, nearly two stories above road level, where first responders had to cut him out of the truck. The damage is absolutely catastrophic. I don't know if I've ever seen a tractor trailer uh, damage to this extent where the driver is still alive. Uh, it is unbelievable uh, amount of carnage. The driver was taken to Sunnybrook Hospital in critical condition. No one else was injured. The crash left debris strewn across the highway. A stretch of it had to be closed for a cleanup for hours, reopening this afternoon. After the break, it was a futuristic landmark. So what does the future hold for Ontario Place? But first... We delve into freshly released court documents that reveal new details into the murders of Barry and Honey Sherman. That story coming up. Plus, starting to see a little bit of sun coming back into the sky, at least by tomorrow afternoon. I'm meteorologist Colette Kennedy. We'll have your complete forecast coming up after the break.
It's been more than a year since Toronto police updated their investigation into the mysterious murders of one of Canada's wealthiest couples. Honey and Barry Sherman were found murdered in their Toronto mansion in December 2017. Three years later, the killings remain unsolved. But court documents recently released following a court challenge by the Toronto Star is shedding light on what police have learned so far. John Lancaster reports. The crime scene, the mansion where Honey and Barry Sherman were murdered three years ago, has been torn down. What remains is an ongoing police investigation. Police haven't said anything publicly about it in more than a year, but recently released court documents reveal some of the evidence they've collected so far. They show the Sherman son, Jonathan, told police there were those who held a grudge against his parents and wanted to harm them. The documents are heavily redacted, so they don't tell us who those potential suspects might be. But they do also say that police believe the couple was murdered here some 36 hours before their bodies were discovered. The documents contain this grainy security image of the last three people believed to have seen the couple alive together. It was late in the afternoon of December 13th, 2017. Three home builders entering Apotex headquarters, the generic drug giant Barry Sherman founded to discuss the custom home the couple was building. Honey Sherman stopped answering her phone later that night. Two days later, a realtor found the couple's bodies in the basement pool area of their mansion. The documents reveal house staff arrived there that morning and told police the home security alarm had been disarmed, something they hadn't seen before. The documents don't tell us how close police might be to solving this case. In an emailed statement to CBC News, Toronto Police say they work on it every single day and describe it as very active. John Lancaster, CBC News, Toronto. Well, what does the future hold for Ontario Place? Almost 10 years since it closed, the answer is still unclear, but perhaps the new year will bring new possibilities. As the government mulls over how to best redevelop it, we got in touch with the daughter of the architect behind the landmark. To get her thoughts, Taylor Simmons has the story. This is the third season for the provincial government's waterfront showcase. In the 70s, the opening of Ontario Place marked a futuristic statement. It, to me, it's a real indication of what can be achieved in Ontario. It, will. it also welcomed all for play, entertainment, and relaxation. The price for admission? Just a buck. We, as kids, we were often dragged off to construction sites on the weekend because that's what my father did. He was keeping an eye on everything. Seidler's father, Ebb, designed several international landmarks, including the Eaton Centre, the Atrium at SickKids, and Ontario Place. He's seen here in a late 80s architecture series. We tried to create here an urban park, um, an extension of the city. It was very exciting, a lot of things people had never seen before. It's this radical, incredible piece of 20th century architecture, and it's this deeply loved and important public space. Fast forward to today, Ontario Place is shuttered. In 2019, the government put out a call for ideas on how to best re-envision Ontario Place. I think one of the criticisms that a lot of people have had of the process is that it hasn't been open. In a statement, the government told CBC Toronto the redevelopment of Ontario Place will play a critical role in the province's economic recovery of COVID-19. The process is ongoing and we will share details at the appropriate time. Seidler and other advocates would like to see the architecture respected. Even more so, they want to see the site public, hosting art galleries, an environmental centre, or even an educational facility. Architecture encloses life. Seidler's father is in the late stages of Alzheimer's and doesn't recall his life as an architect. From what I've heard of the proposals they're looking at, he would be horrified. And in that way, I'm glad he is not mentally around to see what's going on. I think he very much cares about the spirit. That's all he talked about when he, uh, you know, through my life was um, how people engage with places emotionally. That spirit, one of the most important pieces she hopes will remain. Taylor Simmons, CBC News, Toronto. And you're looking at a shot of the Toronto skyline. A bit cloudy tonight with a few clear breaks. We had a few scattered flurries earlier, but that has since dissipated.
Let's bring in our meteorologist, Colette Kennedy now. And Colette, another gloomy day. I think a lot of us would welcome some sunshine at this point. Thanks, Kelda. Yeah, you know, we've just had these gray skies hanging in there, and I guess that's okay because at least our weather pattern is quiet and we don't have the active weather really to deal with, but it would be nice, I'm sure, to get a little bit of sunshine. I think you're all probably thinking that, and I'm going to tell you exactly when that's happening. It will be making a slim brief appearance. No, it will be starting to break through as we get towards the afternoon hours tomorrow. Now, from Hamilton around towards the Niagara region, it may take a little more time, but we should be seeing at least some sunny breaks or more of a mix as we get into the latter part of the day on Wednesday for most of the GTA. Now, end of the week, I've got cool, yet it says seasonal. What's going on here? Well, right now we are a little bit on the mild side, so we're just going back to seasonal. That just happens to be cooler than where our temperatures have been, especially you'll kind of notice with the overnight lows and so those early mornings. The weather pattern though, we will be getting into some clearer conditions and still quiet as we go towards the end of the week and the beginning of the weekend. Just an image from earlier today with some of those wet flurries that we were seeing, some of it even a little bit of lake effect and that disturbance as well that's moving off towards the east. So still some isolated wet flurries tonight, a few areas with a little bit of freezing drizzle. We have that in store. Otherwise, it's mostly just the gray skies. Daytime highs today. This is what I mean. I mean, it's a few degrees above seasonal for this time of year. Kind of nice to be at freezing or just a little bit above too. But what we're talking about with this cloud deck that has just been so stark is as we go through the day on Wednesday, see how it's trying to break up a little bit through here and we begin to get into some sunny breaks. It takes more time though back into southwestern Ontario and I expect you're going to see quite a bit of cloud cover through even Thursday until things start to get a little bit better and then Friday into Saturday quite a bit of sunshine to go around as high pressure builds in. Temperatures overnight tonight, minus one for Windsor and minus one for Leamington through the Harrow region as well. Tomorrow afternoon, high of about two degrees with just some scattered flurries that we'll be experiencing. And again, I, did you see London? Yeah, the sun trying to come through there. Overnight tonight, our low of about minus two. Now feeling like minus six as those winds are kind of more towards the north to northwest. So that will be your wind chill. They're not terribly strong. They will be a little breezier through the day tomorrow, however, with highs of zero to up to two degrees, one for Toronto. And then there's that somewhat cooler, but just seasonal air that's coming in for the end of the week, Kelda, with the sunshine. I like the sunshine part. Thanks so much, Colette. The weather is brought to you by Train, the most reliable heating and cooling brand. We test, so it runs. It's hard to stop a train.
Finally tonight, some Ottawa residents have noticed strange shapes on the Rideau Canal lately. But the National Capital Commission, which manages the skateway, says there's nothing strange about them. They're the result of ice flooding operations to thicken the frozen surface. And this year, crews are working farther apart to socially distance. And that is our show for you tonight. Thank you so much for watching. Just before we go, we do want to update you on the score of the World Juniors gold medal game. Canada facing off against the U.S. The U.S. is up 2-0 right now with about 13 minutes to go in the third period. So still lots of time. So go Team Canada. Have a great night, everyone. I'll see you back here tomorrow night at 11.